a real-time embedded software group at the University of Waterloo, and it has over 10 years of experience in data analytics, pattern recognition, statistical modeling, and machine learning. So JC has uh, extensive works, uh, uh, including writing software for safety critical systems for leaders in the transportation industry, including QNX and uh, Bombarder. Bombarder. So, now, welcome our GC, our speaker. Yeah, very good. Yeah, just before I start, I wanted to get a sense of background of people in the room. Uh, what, what, kind of, uh, what kind of stuff have you guys been studying? Or like, is it mainly engineering, science, like data science? Do we want to give me an example of? All three about. All three about. All, all three. three. Yeah, I think different people represent different groups. All right, perfect. Okay, I think this is going to be interesting then. So, uh, thank you for the wonderful introduction. Uh, my name is Jean Christophe. Uh, you can call me JC or, or JK, as it may be. Uh, I'm the, the CTO and a co founder of Acerta. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about Acerta, but I mainly want to talk about what makes quality data or what makes data quality. And I'm going to try and keep it uh, a little bit general, but I am going to go into specifics about more automotive applications, and in particular, uh, applications in manufacturing. So uh, basically, over the past few years, uh, cars have transformed, and they're transforming at an incredible rate. This is a picture of a wire harness from a modern car. Actually, not even that modern. This was about, I think, seven years ago already. And uh, as you can see, there's a lot of wires connecting a whole bunch of stuff. So basically, What's in here is between 50 and 300 ECUs, or embedded computing units. Uh, these things are little computers that control or measure data from, from the car, it controls its operation. It'll control things like the, the combustion and how that works, uh, or the, the transmission and how it changes, or your electrical power system, all kinds of stuff about the car. And uh, with this complexity, this increasing complexity, um, the, the car becomes more and more difficult to diagnose in terms of its problems. So if something goes wrong, it becomes much more difficult to figure out what exactly did go wrong. And while you're building it, it's difficult to tell whether or not you actually did it right because it becomes so complicated. But a benefit of this complexity and this computerization or electrification is that cars now generate an enormous quantity of data. So how much data? Um, it turns out that during the process of manufacturing, uh, yearly, uh, factories generate about 809 petabytes of data while building cars, which is a pretty incredible number, I think. Um, and incredible, especially when compared against the amount of data that's generated by cars on the road, uh, which is only 93 petabytes, uh, almost a tenth. That's kind of crazy. Like, when you think about how much data is actually generated in a, in, while making a car versus the, the, what's generated by that car while it's running, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of nuts. But this represents an opportunity this data is extremely valuable for optimizing manufacturing processes, for understanding when faults occur, predicting when faults occur in the manufacturing line, optimizing the plant KPIs, or uh, detecting or predicting faults before they occur, uh, while the car's even driving, potentially. Sorry? Quick question, is this for car or for auto? This is definitely not for car, absolutely not. <laughs> no, this is the entire automotive industry, period. So like, every single company that manufactures even an automotive component. So everything from the earliest part of the supply chain all the way up to when an OEM releases that car. That's what's being generated in the 809 petabytes. Versus 93 petabytes, this is the data generated by all the connected cars on the road today. Does that make sense? Yeah. Who are Google vehicles? Like autonomous vehicles? I don't know if that's included in this number. I'd have to check the citation. But uh, uh, obviously, they're going to generate a huge amount of data. Any other questions? Yeah? Uh, does it differ greatly between different uh, car manufacturers? Oh, 100%. So uh, there's a couple different manufacturers, uh, like uh, Nissan, for instance, they don't generate that much data. If you look at uh, General Motors car, they're going to generate a huge amount. Um, and what's really interesting is, well, I'm going to talk a little bit more about what makes quality data versus not quality and what, it's, what that looks like. But um, it isn't just about the amount of data you collect, but also how you collect it that makes the difference. Um, just a quick one. So, um, what does it mean actually? Ninety-three petabytes. Does it mean interaction with 
um, infrastructure on the road because we don't have really at the moment still even in our big cities mm -hmm. good infrastructure that goes you know in intelligent way right. communication between car and what is going on on the road so not all of this 93 petabytes will even be collected by a centralized uh, data management system in fact a lot of this data is going to be generated and then maybe aggregated before it's sent out so all these little ecus in this car they're going to generate a lot of information, store it on a buffer, usually a circular buffer, and if anything goes wrong, they'll collapse it and summarize it and then ship it out. That's the typical like uh, connected car kind of process. So I, I'm involved in that previous picture. Is a circuit that's a, a this is, this computer? Is a, it's a modern wire harness. There's many computers in a modern car, between 50 and 300 in some cases. Uh, and they're running millions of lines of code. It's kind of crazy how complicated cars have become. Because I see some uh, dots there. Those could be sensors. Yeah, they could be sensors. They could be other types of equipment. Yeah, that wire harness is really uh, the nervous system, right? It connects everything, not just the computers together. Uh, they're running the car. <coughs> really, cars are now just kind of rolling computers more than anything else. They just happen to have engines because they need to move. Um, so, this data represents an opportunity for industry to transform. So, industry has gone through multiple different transformations over its existence over the past 100 plus years. Um, so, the first innovation was really like steam power, and then it was electrification, so like using electrical power to get things done. This obviously improved how people were able to accomplish tasks in a manufacturing line, but also uh, it was the production lines, and then the computerization of the production lines, uh, what are called like uh, Manufacturing execution systems, MES systems. These things control everything that goes on the line. It makes it more reproducible, more reliable, um, more controlled. Industry 4.0 is really um, the transformation towards IoT, where those MES systems that are controlling all of this manufacturing, they also generate and collect a lot of data about what's going on so that you can uh, understand better when something goes wrong or potentially uh, learn how to optimize the process. So Industry 4.0 is really where sort of is kind of centralized. That's what we're attempting to help companies uh, achieve. Right now, the industry is basically in Industry 3, 3.0, and it's shifting towards this, this vision of 4.0, of a, of a connected plant. So sort of sees itself as uh, the analytics supplier for automotive. We want to be the analytics supplier for this, this data. Uh, we want to be involved in the, the process of vehicle manufacturing right from its design all the way to its inception and finally to uh, when it's decommissioned. We kind of want to be the analysis tool from cradle to grave of the car, you might think. Um, our reach is global, so we have customers including GM, Nissan. Uh, the three down here you might not recognize if you're not in the automotive industry, but Dana, Tyson, and Musashi are all tier one manufacturers. They build components that go into cars. Um, so people choose us because uh, we specialize in automotive applications. We concentrate solely on automotive. We don't touch any other industry. That's very intentional. We believe it's extremely important to speak the language of the industry that we're working with, not just because we want to be able to extract uh, domain knowledge from our data and understand it very well to improve our models efficiency, but also because once we generate results, we need to be able to communicate those to engineers and line workers so that they understand what the results of our model is telling them. Uh, so we have a team with an extensive AI and automotive background as a consequence. Um, we also have this perspective of data that should be holistic, right? We want to collect the entire history of a car uh, in, our, in our database. And we're on-premise computing enabled. This, this doesn't matter as much for you guys, but essentially it lets us deploy models as executables directly to the line so that model doesn't rely upon the internet, which is very important for manufacturing uh, applications where if the internet goes down, you don't want your line to go down. So that's all I'm going to talk about for Asserta. I want the rest to be about uh, data science, but I feel like as a C-level executive in my company, I got a pitch. That's, that's just a fact. So I'm going to talk mostly about quality and change and how that affects uh, data science with respect to manufacturing and industry. Yes? Do you use any of your models to go into warranty, say, warranty policies and pricing and recovery? So the way that our models touch uh, warranty is that we'll actually attempt to explain 
uh, warranty case from the uh, manufacturing data. So if we find a correlation between manufacturing data and a warranty case, that'll inform us of how to improve that product. Uh, but if we can't find that correlation, it might be further evidence, for instance, that actually the, the manufacturing process was uh, carried out successfully and it may be a, a point of use with the way that the product was used that caused the, the recall. Right. And that's very useful information for a corporation. Sure. But they may not act on it. They're probably going to still uh, treat it as a warranty. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah no problem. So uh, there's basically five aspects of quality that I want to talk about. Uh, the top three you're probably familiar with if you have a background in science. So accuracy, precision, and repeatability. These are basically qualities that tell you, or qualities that you might be interested in for evaluating how good an experiment design is. Um, but there's two extra here, traceability and completeness that I'm gonna talk about as well. These are outside of the concept of a scientific experiment, and they're necessary for making good data sets from, uh, from real life, because unfortunately real life is not an experiment. You don't have this experiment design giving you that traceability and completeness that you wouldn't otherwise have. So let's talk about the first three, uh, accuracy, precision, and repeatability. So these plots represent those concepts, which is generally, it's fake data, don't worry about it. Uh, we'll talk about accuracy first. So, represented in this plot is uh, measurements from two devices, a calibrated and an uncalibrated device. So a calibrated one is going to tell you, it's gonna give you an accurate measurement. What that means is that the measurement corresponds to reality. If I measure a pencil that's five centimeters long, it's quite short pencil, fine, uh, and I, it turns out that it, my ruler is telling me it's 10 centimeters, then my ruler is not accurate. It's not telling me the truth. So. Uh, the problem with calibration affects manufacturing a great deal, and that's because the measurement devices that are used in manufacturing are used 24-7, 365 days a year. These things wear out, they get, become miscalibrated, and that's a very significant problem for both the, the processes, the test uh, systems that are generated uh, from the manufacturing process, but also for diagnosis. Um, so these, these plots up here, about 10 plots of 10 different signals measured during the process of manufacturing uh, an axle, an axle assembly, which is actually pretty complicated. Uh, if you've ever had a chance to look at them, they're a large collection of gears, and sometimes in the case of hybrid cars, like uh, they, they become very complicated because they incorporate a motor and, and other things. These measures are used to determine the quality of the differential as it makes its way through the line. And what you can see in different colors is the distribution of the data collected from this de these devices as they're manufactured over time. And you can see that for each color, there's quite a significant difference between months. For what would otherwise be a, com a largely computer-controlled manufacturing process, it's surprising to see such differences month over month. And this could be either from calibration or there are kinds of problems. If we zoom into case measure two, and across two months, we can see that uh, there's a pretty significant difference in both the mean and standard deviation across these two months, two adjacent months. This could be from lack of calibration, maybe the device became miscalibrated, but it could be from the suppliers, what if we're getting steel that's low quality. Um, it could be from process adjustments, so maybe I changed the process slightly to address another quality issue. Uh, it could be from employee schedules, so humans are still involved in the process, they still have an effect on it, they can still change uh, the outcome. And finally, the weather. Things like the weather can actually affect uh, the quality of the, the part that's manufactured because temperature uh, and environmental pressure can affect some manufacturing processes. But if we don't know that our devices are calibrated and that we're getting accurate measurements of reality, we can't differentiate any of these problems from our manufacturing process. And that goes for our models too. If our models are looking at the stata, we won't be able to tell the difference between uh, a process that's changed and a device has become miscalibrated. So this affects even, uh, even sensors that affect uh, acceptance criteria. So this is the same set of differentials. Um, clearance A, clearance AB, and clearance B are all measures that are used to determine the performance of a particular differential. It's ba it basically represents uh, the distance between the gears, which greatly affects its operational efficiency. Um, even here, you see significant differences. This should be a, a, a clarion call to check your calibration and possibly update your models, retrain them, you might think. We actually take an approach where for models, uh, 
that are deployed, we notice a change in the data that we observe month over month that we believe is a systematic one. Uh, for example, a steel supplier change. We might actually choose to train a new model for that month, or maybe a new model every month to try and explain that line. Whereas if it's a seasonal change, something that happens uh, repetitively or periodically, we might choose to train a single model and wrap up all the data together. It really depends on the nature of that change. We've, we've realized over time that it's important to consider these, these possibilities when examining this kind of drift over time. And as a consequence, we've started to build a framework internally for normalizing the difference, uh, differences between our models so that we can run batteries and models against each other and figure out what strategy or what, what model archetype is best adjusting to the drift that we observe. So, uh, Coliseum is basically our ML ops system. It allows us to scale the exploration of architectures and paradigms across a large compute cluster that we have internally. It lets us tune hyperparameters, uh, track the data that the models were trained with. Uh, it's, it lets us version the dependencies as well, so we can track the dependencies of our models by Docker and similar. Um, and we can actually export the model architectures JSON so that when we, when, uh, excuse me, when we want to reproduce a result, we can grab that architecture and that data and uh, reproduce it. So it also lets us deploy those models because it can package them uh, for deployment uh, using Kubeflow. Um, to give you a sense of what the like, data science life cycle is at Asserta and how we, how we operate, we collect data from our customers and perform data ingestion to normalize all of the data that we collect. We have an internal system for tracking manufacturing data. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, we query that, and we put it into Jupyter, we start processing it using our cluster, and we build a set of models. Each model and all the data, all the artifacts we generate gets tracked. Uh, right now we're actually using uh, MLflow for tracking these artifacts. When we're ready to deploy a model, we end up using Kubeflow and uh, Kubernetes. So when, when we set up this process, we were designing it around adapting to drift. So as we notice drift, we started to build a system for uh, tackling drift automatically. Uh, we have a system that automatically retrains models that have been deployed to Kubernetes. So when we detect drift from the data that we ingest using our monitoring system, we generate events that indicate the type of drift that we observe so that we can respond to it most effectively. That might mean training a new model each month, as I, as I said, or updating an old model with new data. And, uh, here you can see a kind of a little bit of the workflow. Basically, the trainer tests a bunch of models or different model retraining strategies, registers all the results, and if the if we find a model that's better than what's already deployed, that model will go through acceptance testing as part of CI/CD. Are you all familiar with what CI/CD is or DevOps? It's like a release management system, kind of. It's a, an automatic process, essentially of uh, doing acceptance testing on a software product. It's the same thing for machine learning. This is kind of a newer concept in the world of data science. I think, uh, I think Microsoft coined the term uh, ML ops this year, in fact, but it's becoming increasingly important to operationalize machine learning uh, in a very automatic and very uh, repeatable way because it's become too manual to generate all these models and deploy them uh, over and over again especially as we re realize that we need to adapt our models over time. So um, the lessons from accuracy essentially are that we need to monitor the data as it is ingested. We need to check problems or check for problems every time we notice drift and classify them into uh, calibration issues or otherwise. And we need to respond to them dynamically. So we need to be able to adapt our models constantly in order to deliver quality results. So we can talk a little bit about precision. This one's much shorter mostly because solutions to this can't really be systematic. If, when measuring something, you're using a device that is imprecise, uh, you're gonna find that your results are poor. So let's say, uh, again, to go back to the example of the differential from before, you have on the y-axis clearances A, A, B, and B, and on the x-axis, a couple different values. Uh, what you'll notice is that for values that are not used for acceptance criteria, we have a great deal of resolution. In other words, you see these black bands because all those dots are tightly packed. But for the values that are used for acceptance criteria, they're, they're very discrete. You don't have values measured in between those values, or in between those bands. 
That's because the device that they're using to measure, uh, or the caliper that they're using to measure this, this distance is actually not that precise. It's, they're trying to measure uh, millimeters or finger sticks, right? It's just, it's not gonna work. Um, you would think that you'd be able to foresee this problem and uh, design your process around it, but the truth is, you have to make sure that your process is adaptable as a manufacturer. Just because you think you've got it figured out at the beginning doesn't mean that you'll uh, realize a problem later that you need to account for and adjust for. Um, so, in, in conclusion, just like my better version of tools. I don't really have better advice to solve that problem because you just, you just need good tools, that's it. Um, for repeatability, uh, this is a problem of, uh, or that comes up in experiment design where if you do the same process with the same input, you get the same result. And you would hope that that's the case, but in manufacturing, that's not always the case. In fact, you can see three examples here that are kind of problematic. Um, this is actually the same uh, EPS system or electrical power steer steering system. Um, so when electrical power steering systems are tested, you check whether or not vibrations from the, the ground reach the steering wheel because that makes for an uncomfortable ride. You don't want to feel the road with hands. Um, so they usually check for vibrations in this, this data. The problem is, well, you could punch the mic, as it turns out. And uh, this, this test is unreliable because there's so many things that can leak into your, your vibration sensor that you wouldn't expect. So they need to repeat this test many times, eight times, in, uh, in fact, to get a reliable result. So in these three instances, somebody's kicked the microphone or something and you've ended up with bad data. So if you have a, a problem like this, you need to approach it systematically. You need to run the, the, the test multiple times if you can't make it reliable, uh, or adjust the process until it is reliable. Or you need to adapt a system where, as with our monitor previously, if we detect drift, we send it to our sanity checking service, which basically collects data from that, that set and determines whether or not the data collected makes any sense whatsoever. You might think that that's, that's kind of a silly thing to do, but it turns out that we see data that makes absolutely no sense whatsoever uh, quite frequently when a sensor goes bad, for instance. Um, we've seen case measures that are reported distances that are the size of the entire factory, which is obviously wrong. That shouldn't happen. This is the kind of sanity that I'm talking about. I'm not saying does it, does it meet any small like criteria or acceptance um, bands or whatever. I'm saying really big differences between our expectations and reality. Uh, when you do come across such things, especially in a systematic way, you want to report those either to your user or to yourself so that you can adjust. So the lessons for repeatability are really about uh, reporting uh, unreliable measurements or adapting your processes if possible and monitoring your data for sensible values. So this is something that you need to do whenever you ingest any data set really. Um, so that's it for the scientific uh, properties that make quality data. I'm gonna get into more detail about the things that you have to account for when you're not dealing with a, like a formal scientific experiment design. And if they, excuse me, I'm just gonna have a sip. Yeah, I ran out of moisture, sorry about that. So uh, traceability, what is it? Traceability is about identity. And what I mean is, when, when data is traceable, you can identify the exact source of that information, the exact source of that data, which is a really important concept and a very difficult one to get a hold of in the manufacturing industry. So what I have represented up here is a manufacturing line, a very simple one, incorporating only uh, three operations and an end-of-line test, that's the UL. Um, so each of these processes are generating different data. And to create a complete picture of what I'm building, let's say I'm building a transmission. You all know what a transmission is? Cool. Um, so let's say I'm building a transmission. Uh, let's call the transmission John. I'm calling it a name to emphasize the fact that identity is important in this case. Um, when I'm building John through this first run through the, the manufacturing process, when does John become John? When does the transmission become a transmission? From the perspective of a manufacturer, it's when it's complete. But what if I'm trying to model it? I want to know data from operation number one. What if it doesn't even have a serial number? 
I still need to be able to identify it. I still need to connect it to John because if I want to build a data set out of the data collected from all these operations, I need to join it together. That means I need an identity to assign for that data. So John really gains this identity in operation one. So this is kind of like one of those philosophical problems where I pile sand and such and determine when the, the grains of sand become a pile. The truth is, even one grain of sand is a pile and, and from the perspective of data science. I need to know exactly where a chunk of data came from. So what if it fails? What if John fails us? It turns out we need to fix John. Well, typically what happens is we'll go back to an earlier stage of the process, take out a part, replace a part, test it again, see what happens. So we'll run John through the, the ropes again. This is kind of a, a ship of Theseus problem, right? I'm pulling planks off my ship and I'm replacing it with fresh timber. Is it the same ship? Anybody want to hazard a guess? No? Uh, the answer is, it's a different ship. In fact, any change that's made to the transmission makes it a new transmission. This is no longer John. This is like Dave or something. <laughs> so, now that we've got Dave, I guess it's sensible that it's generating a new set of data, and Dave has different data, that's fine. Maybe it's very similar data, but that's fine. It's a manufacturing process. It should all be pretty similar. What if it fails again, but we don't need to go all the way back? What if we're only generating data from operation number two, and now we make Tom or something, I don't know. We have now three transmissions, three independent separate transmissions, but the third one has a unique problem. It doesn't have any data for operation one. What do we do? Who wants to guess? Can you take the data from the second run? Yeah. And add it to the third? For sure. That's a, that's a completely valid approach. And in fact, that might work. But if you do that, you got to be really careful. So if you do that, and you take Tom, and you put Tom in your testing set, and you put Dave, number two, put Dave in your training set, you're now leaking information about your training set into your testing set. Because operation one, that data, it makes it into your testing set. So if you do that, which is completely valid, you need to be extremely careful about how you separate your data into different places. So uh, look, in conclusion, each assembly has a different identity, uh, even if it has the same serial number. So serial number is not correlated with your identity. Uh, but also, you need to be very careful about how you isolate data once you assemble it for your training set. So uh, let's talk about completeness. What does completeness mean? Does that involve? Um, so completeness is really about measuring the right stuff. So that sounds like a simple enough task, but the problem is not about necessarily measuring the right stuff, but being able to adjust what you're measuring over time in a manufacturing setting. Because you may find that your manufacturing process has problems that you didn't anticipate. That means measuring new things. If your system is set up in such a way that it's difficult to measure anything, that's a problem. So like, if we're looking at an engine and we're trying to characterize the, uh, the quality of the combustion in that engine. We're going to look at the inputs to the combustion and the outputs. The inputs in terms of air, fuel, oxygen, uh, pressure, temperature, those kinds of things. And we're going to look at the output, like NOx, ox or remaining oxygen, um, CO2, CO, those kinds of like chemical outputs. If we're missing some of these values, it may be difficult to characterize our combustion. That means maybe we'll need to add sensors in the future if previously we were just worried about engine temperature and overheating. So measuring or dealing with uh, completeness isn't just about measuring the right stuff, but also getting the right amount of stuff. So let's say uh, we're measuring not quite sufficient data to reconstruct a signal. This is a very simple one. The red signal represents a sine wave. Treat it as reality. This is the signal that we're trying to represent in our data. And we take a sample of three points, which generates this nice blue curve, which looks absolutely nothing like reality. If we're trying to model a process that evolves over time, we can't simply assume that our samples are good enough. Uh, who's familiar with Perry Nyquist? Nobody? Oh, all right. Well, <laughs> Perry Nyquist is going to haunt your dreams if you deal with time series. 
uh, even just increasing the amount of data that you collect blindly is not going to be enough. You actually need to understand some of the properties of your data. That means what, what is the nightmare rate, the rate at which you can reliably reproduce the, uh, the original signal um, and the rate of sampling, I, I, I mean, to be specific. Um, so let's say we sample with the night rate. Well, it turns out we get a very nice sine wave reconstruction. Maybe it doesn't look perfect, but it's not bad. We've got a problem though. So this is automotive, or at least my problems are in automotive. Automotive uses something called CAN bus to uh, transmit data across that wire harness that I showed you at the beginning of the presentation. Canvas has a number of problems, chief among them being the amount of data sent in each packet. Basically, every time I want to send a message over Canvas, I have eight bytes that I can put data into, which if you don't know anything about bytes, that's basically nothing. So I have to make a sacrifice when I send a message. When I send a message, I have to choose what signal do I send? How often do I send it? Typically, what happens for signals that may not be mission critical for a car or for a part. I'm going to send signals, let's say, aperiodically or somewhat at random. If I do that and I try and use the Nyquist rate to guide how much data I should measure, I'm going to get pretty garbage results. As you can see, this looks absolutely nothing like a sign up. So what do I do? I have to really understand my data and the way that I'm collecting it in order to collect good data. And to do that, I have to know, in this specific example, what my inter-arrival time is. As you can see, the inter-arrival time, which is the time in between samples, on average produces a mean which is far from my necklace rate, which is bad. I want the mean of my inter-arrival time to mirror the necklace rate of the signal, and if it does, then I get a nice looking construction. So this is the kind of level of detail that you need uh, to dive into when you're measuring data about a system. You really need to worry about not just what you're collecting, but how you're collecting it, how much of it you're collecting. What's the rate? What's the sensor like? There's huge amounts of limitations that you need to consider when dealing with real production uh, scenarios. We can't all have nice sensors. We can't have tons of expensive sensors. It's not always a science experiment. Sometimes we need to build systems that are cheap. One question. <clears throat> So well, here the time is in seconds, you have it on the bottom? Yes. <clears throat> so, because uh, I'm familiar a little bit with uh, Azure uh, uh, machine learning analytics stack. Okay. So, um, they can put like, uh, I mean, when we are talking about how often you measure, yeah, you can put it like, you know, uh, like they have almost like real-time streaming data coming to your uh, sure. environment. Yeah. So uh, what uh, will be the issue of having uh, something like that? It will be too much data or you... you As a consequence of the bus that's used for commu communication, you're limited in what you can transmit in terms of the volume. Oh, okay. So you have to make sacrifices. That's why this kind of stuff happens. You have to sacrifice something. Something's got to give. Uh, So uh, what if we make different kinds of stuff? Most manufacturing lines don't make one product with one model. They might make several. And the funny thing is, a lot of these, uh, these different product models are made by sometimes completely different people who have very different ideas about how stuff should be named, which is very frustrating. Uh, as you can see here, we have many different names for basically the same data. Um, and what you need to do whenever you're processing it is have really good metadata, just because the, the machine reports these values to me. I actually, I'm not satisfied with that. I need to know what is the name of the signal, what unit is it, uh, what was the measurement device. I need to know all this kind of information to actually process it and compare things across different product models. Um, and sort of the way that we deal with a lot of these problems that I've discussed about completeness is uh, Cortex, a system that we have internally for ingesting data and uh, normalizing it, putting it to a relatively normal form or for reporting when data doesn't meet the, the quality standards set by basically a negotiation between us and our, our client. From that normalized data structure, we can actually extract data in the shape that we want uh, for various different applications, uh, AI or, or otherwise. 
And the, this system has been designed around manufacturing data and uh, automotive data collected during, uh, during driving situations. So this, this system is really good at capturing that kind of information. Um, so kind of the lessons to learn about completeness are really around uh, planning to adapt the data that you collect over time and knowing how to uh, collect data for your specific use case, knowing exactly what the, the nature of that data is and the collection mechanism and also plan to adapt to changes in metadata over time. You can't assume that the same people are making your product all the time. Yeah? Um, why should the, well, you, you kind of described it very nicely, that the process itself and measurements have to be adaptable sure. to, to the dynamics. Uh, but who told us that uh, the functions that we're considering have yeah. to free a transform to apply the Nike theorem? I mean, Nike theorem is the connection between continuum and discrete processes sure. and definitely you may have much more frequencies it, not to necessarily be able to apply the Nike theorem. Yes, so um, when, when you set out to design a system for collection you need to understand the, the requirements so maybe you can't capture all the, the frequencies that you need to right? exactly. but uh, that might be a sacrifice you have to make as well you may need to choose what level of aliasing you're willing to accept. And uh, if, if you have to accept that, then you have to accept it. There's no, there's no alternative. Right. Is that kind of... Yeah, 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 exactly. It's yeah. really a matter of... But, you know, kind of my, my only point that definitely, I mean, in this area, sometimes it's kind of dangerous even to apply the, the Nike theorem, All, although it's the only met, strictly mathematical tool that we have. Yeah, yeah. So that's, like, that's true, but... Yeah. The, the way that you deal with that too is, so if you're designing a process around such a theorem, you also have to account for lots of variability in the equipment that you're using sure. and all that stuff. So Absolutely. just take it and double it. Like if yeah, you're an engineer, yeah. you design the theorem, you do, you do all this stuff, and then what do you do? You multiply it by two or 10 or 30, sure. and then the problem is solved. Like, is sure. it robust enough to not crash? Okay, great, double it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah. they're coming like to human intelligence here rather than to artificial one. Yes, so I, that's kind of the perspective that I wanted to, to give all of you from, from industry, like doing this stuff for, for applications where like dollars and cents matter. Um, just to give you guys a different perspective. So this, this is actually uh, everything that I wanted to talk about today so far. So like, if you have any questions or you want to learn more things or, or whatever, just go ahead and ask. Yeah. Do you see a big difference between uh, classical cars and electrical ones? In terms of? Manufacturing. Sure, yeah. Um, the complexity of the, the, the power and delivery system is completely reduced, right? It's, it's a fraction of, uh, of what a combustion engine is going to do. The, the combustion engine, like the modern combustion engine, I say modern probably with large quotes because uh, I mean, the, it hasn't fundamentally changed that much in the past like, 100 years or whatever. Um, it's extremely complicated. And uh, an electrical motor and an electrical power system is very, very simplistic by comparison. And as a consequence, likely much more reliable. So how, about, uh, how about the battery? You know, can you, the battery, can you rely on the battery? The battery, correspondingly, is very unreliable. <laughs> And that's probably the big problem with yeah. electric cars that as we're working on it. <clears throat> Correct me if I'm wrong, but, but I think you, you are passing a very important message uh, here that effectively if we have data yeah. which is already unreliable, yeah. we could make very big mistakes. Absolutely. And therefore, therefore it is extremely important you know, to, to, to preserve this reliability and, as you call it, adaptability yeah. during the process of collecting this data. 100%. And, and this is, indeed, not many people kind of passing through this message. You, usually the approach, in many cases in data science, hey, we have this big chunk of data, let's kind of extract useful yeah. information exactly. like that. But the, the, that information could be found. Yeah, in fact, you could easily lie to yourself. I mean, there's a saying about data, right? If you torture it enough, it'll tell you anything. Yeah. So people start talking about big data and they mislead. 
Yeah. And they do say the IBM summer is a big day and everybody's a four Bs. One of them is the velocity. So that's sort of big noises in the world. Yeah. So I have a quick question, Paul. Sure. So you get the data from manufacturing directly. Yeah. And how much time you spend on rendering the data to kind of clean up, make sure it the uh, okay to go ahead and to do the modeling? I think the, the very first time we approach a data set from a new company, it's always a very uh, long-winded exercise. Uh, mostly because that data collect, collection practices across companies are very different. Some people have a very advanced system uh, where they track and, and monitor almost everything. And other companies might just keep a couple Excel files on a Windows server or something. So it, the process varies wildly. Um, after that initial kind of uh, adaptation phase, uh, the amount of time spent ranking data goes down significantly. But still, I would say uh, the amount of time that uh, we spend on feature engineering is probably uh, larger than the amount of time we spend making unique models. Yeah. Um, especially in manufacturing applications. In automotive applications, it's a bit different because we're dealing with much more complex like uh, when I say I mean on on road applications are much more complicated because you have to deal with time series. That means that the, the architectures that you have to use for your neural networks get much more varied and and uh, complex. But for for manufacturing, the models are usually simpler because you're really after not not prediction but inference. You want to want to understand why your model is making a particular decision instead of making it produce the best. Uh, prediction. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. okay. So, uh, so when you make uh, unique models for different manufacturers, do you like create your own optimizers and loss functions, or do you, do you use like some stable ones in some cases? So most of the time, we use things just like Adam, and, and that's been enough for for the optimizer. Uh, for the loss function, though, we can get pretty varied. But sometimes we actually incorporate dollar cost in our loss function because that will get you the best result. Um, not in terms of its uh, like accuracy, but in terms of its actual like, monetary output, right? So you don't necessarily want to optimize a model for producing a good prediction. Sometimes you want to optimize it for producing the most money. Mm -hmm. um, I'd say those cases are still pretty small, only like ten percent of the models that we that we generate. That makes sense. And, and if continue on this question, like what is inside of this uh, optimizer? What sort of what's, what mathematical proofs are inside of this, you know, log that you have? Talking about Adam or, or no, op optimize it basically when when you are saying okay, you know, what sort of loss function to choose and things sure. like that. Yeah. So effectively, you are solving some optimization or control yeah. problem. What, what is inside there? Do do you have like choices in which cases what to choose? Yeah, how to optimize? Choices. You or? can you can put almost anything into a cost function that you want. Um, whether or not that's going to generate a useful result is a, is a whole other matter. Um, and, and typically, you want certain properties out of your loss function. Like you want it to be, you want you want it to be curved. You don't want any uh, like local minima. So there's some like general advice about making making cost functions that apply us for the most part. Like make it quadratic or something. Make it make it explosive in its increase of of, of cost or, or loss as the the Error increases, right? You want you want the the you want the, the solution space to be bowl shaped. Does that make sense? Because um, if you think about it, your model is kind of like a ball rolling in a bowl. You want the loss function to look like a bowl as a consequence. Does that make sense? Yeah. Are you able to share some of the models, or for example, a specific uh, manufacturer step? You use only one model, or sometimes you have to adapt to a different one depending on. Uh, so that's that's an interesting question. So uh, if I if I look at a manufacturing process as a sequence of operations, most of the time the manufacturer has each individual operation pretty well figured out. I'm not going to say 100% figured out, but uh, they're going to have a pretty good idea of what they expect as the output of that operation to be. What manufacturers don't do a good job of right now is collecting and collating that data across all of the operations and extracting insight from that picture. 
it's a much more complicated thing to do, and they don't really do it as a matter of course. So it's kind of a new thing for them to, to answer your question. Uh, you can address the first one. Okay. Uh, if you have some examples of, if you can share that, of uh, machine learning models like, that uh, you apply. Okay, so like architectures kind of? Yeah, the type of uh, machine models. So uh, some of that is IP, so I'm not going to dive too deep into that. Uh, but it being time series, you can probably wager a few educated guesses about what types of uh, layers we put in our model architecture, like uh, LSTM and, and, and WaveNet and similar. Um, but I'm not going to dive too deep into the architecture. I'm sorry, it's just like, it's, it's IP. Yeah. Uh, how much of an impact do the models actually make on the manufacturing process? Sure, yeah. So uh, manufacturing is usually evaluated in a couple of different KPIs, key performance indicators. Um, so how, how good a uh, plant is doing is based off of uh, a few different things, like uh, first time quality. So like, does a uh, freshly manufactured transmission pass the end of line testing process the first time? Uh, so the rate at which that is accomplished is a really huge KPI. Um, typically manufacturers will run about 95%. Uh, but each of those percents is like a million dollars per line, uh, in some cases per month, in other cases per year. So increasing that FTQ by a tiny bit is a huge deal. Um, there's also rework rates. So once something doesn't pass the first time, it has to go through and be reworked. That's the difference between like John, Dave, and Tom, right? Um, that process is very expensive. And so the rate at which units have to be reworked is also usually incorporated. This is sometimes represented as a cost uh, or a ratio or, or otherwise. And then the last one is, uh, what else, there's another one. Uh, I'll think of it, but basically our impact has been on the order of up to 5% in, uh, in FTQ for some of our manufacturers, for some of our manufacturing customers, which is, which is quite a big deal. Um, that, that kind of answer your question there? Yeah. Yeah. Just the curiosity. Um, sure. You mentioned that Nissan, for some reason, does not collect a lot of data during manufacturing process. Is it a good thing? It means that they do that so precisely? In, in fact, accidentally, I, I was on assembly plant in Kitakyushu in Japan, Nissan example. Oh, yeah. And I was, it, it was 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I haven't seen any human there. <laughs> 15 years ago. Yeah. Uh, so it was absolutely automated and I was absolutely impressed. I cannot compare like with other, you know, competing car manufacturing companies, but right. so I'm just curious your comment, like is it, it does it mean that they do that so well they don't need to do like uh, anything in addition? So just a point of clarity for that one. Um, when I was saying they collect less data, I was referring to uh, on the road. Uh -huh. So Nissan cars, as they're driving, uh, okay. collect a fraction of the data. Not during manufacturing, right? During manufacturing, they're actually quite comparable. In fact, yeah. I'd say Nissan might even have all stuff there. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to make too many comments about my customers. <laughs> 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 so, uh, how much so many employees uh, in your company? Uh, how many data scientists? Uh, CERN is now at about 32 data scientists. Uh, Eight data scientists right now. So for for example, if you hire three of us, Sarah, <laughs> Kai, and Peter, sure. and we have different level of data <laughs> skills. Yeah. So do I actually have the chance to go through the data wrangling, data model, or computer viable for that? Yeah, for in fact, I like, might contribute to our, our library of tools. We we maintain a, a large set of libraries that we use for pre-processing data. Uh, building models in an automated way, uh, and it's all kind of integrated into our Colosseum system. Basically, we have a standard protocol for communication between model components. You can build up pipelines. It's very similar, actually, in concept to Kubeflow. In our integration with Kubeflow, we translate the, the model pipelines into a Kubeflow pipeline mm -hmm. uh, in, in that way. So you might implement one of those steps, or you might implement a brand new model, but you'll probably end up touching data and going in uh, at some point during the so, um, 
Not because I love my level so much, I always have to handle data cleaning. Sure. So I, I don't want to just work with some of the jobs. So how many interns do you have per year? What's the term? Uh, we usually have four data, the data science group uh, between uh, one and two interns. I think right now we have one intern. Yeah, we have one intern right now. Mm -hmm. So if our data science students are interested in working in your company, can they contact you or yeah, for someone sure. else? My email's right here. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, do I have that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? I was uh, wondering, uh, thinking that, for example, uh, Elon Musk Starship now has troubles to get finalized, sure. and they also had the issues with the SpaceX, uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, booster landing and things like that. Yeah. Can this system be used to optimize the manufacture of uh, like new products like rockets and stuff? Probably, yeah. I mean, a lot of the models that we build have a lot of automotive. Uh, domain knowledge built into them, but uh, the, the core principles remain the same between different mechanical systems. The, the problem for us as a company, however, is that it isn't just about data science, we also have a uh, sales team, business development, and uh, a network of connections that, that make us successful in the automotive industry, right? It's, it's like a whole picture that we need to assemble to sell to enterprise and a sector like that. So if we were to do that, we need to probably change the entire organization in order to accommodate uh, a customer like that, if that makes sense. But technically it's feasible, yeah? Technically feasible, sure. Yeah, I would say so. Yeah? Can you add them to your models, or is that possible? Uh, so we, we spoke at length multiple times to add lawyers, and they basically said, you know what? Forget it. Don't even bother. Keep it a, keep it a company secret. Um, and that's that's probably the best way to do it because really it is an algorithm and algorithms have a, a kind of complex history and interaction with patents and that you pretty much can't patent them and so even if you manage to successfully patent it defending the patent is really a matter of who's got the most cash so it's a small company uh, you just it's just better to keep it a secret. I was wondering uh, how accurate are your uh, machine learning models because they are not 100% uh, bulletproof, yeah? Sure, yeah. In fact, uh, a lot of the time you don't even necessarily need accuracy. Accuracy might even be a bad measure because when you're, when you're measuring how well a model is doing for a particular manufacturing line, uh, consider that the majority of units that are generated by that line should work. It's the minority that, that, that don't. You might be inclined towards using things like AUC that are slightly less biased. I'll say slightly because even AUC is subject to bias of some, uh, some sorts. Uh, so you need to be careful in defining uh, the, the metrics that you use to evaluate how good a model you generate is. In our case, uh, I would say it's on a case by case basis. I think it really depends on the application and what it's being used for. So, as an example, for a manufacturing model that's attempting to build this terminology used a lot, uh, a digital twin, where you model the process that's being used in the line to better understand how different components of that process affect the whole. Uh, for models like that, you only need AUC of uh, about 80 in order to gather useful insight. Um, and our models are typically well above that, but even when they're below, it's still useful insight. It means the data you're collecting from your process is not informing you of how well it will do in the end. That's actually useful information all on its own. Uh, that makes sense. Does that answer your question? A little bit faster. So you said that uh, the manufacturing line is okay if majority of the output is okay. So that means we, we are starting from the premise that uh, you know we don't have to be 100% reliable in the parts, for example, that are part of the car. Yeah. Is that true? Or? Uh, so perhaps I misspoke, but essentially what I'm saying is that um, the, the effect that a, a machine learning company can have on manufacturing is taking uh, FDQ from 90 to 95, taking FDQ from 95 to 98. Uh, the differences that you're going to make are small. And so when you compare or when you measure the accuracy of a model, if the majority of the instances that you're examining 
are actually positive examples. Well, accuracy is actually a poor measure. You can get 90% by accident, right? You want to use something like AFC that's slightly less biased. So if you use AFC, you might not even need high AFC to make a difference. Because most of the time you're interested in what parts of the process affect the result, and less so producing a better prediction of whether or not this item will pass or fail in the system. So a big part of it is actually going in the opposite direction, doing inference. Uh, but prediction is also useful. So for, for prediction, the reliability of that prediction needs to be at least as good as the test that's being run at that particular operation. And, and in those cases, the criteria, our acceptance criteria for deploying that model is doing better than the manufacturer themselves. Is that, yeah. Okay, yeah, no problem. So, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go just ahead. one quick question. I'm just wondering what kind of software do you use to do your prototypes? If you sure. need some commercial products as well. So, uh, we, we used to be uh, pretty much in our shop for our data science, but we've migrated almost entirely to Python. That said, most of our infrastructure supports both R and Python. We build most of our models in a combination of uh, sklearn and uh, Keras and TensorFlow. Okay. This is the direction you're thinking, right? This yeah. Is the, yeah. So I'm um, just wondering if you, I, I'm puzzled if you don't use MATLAB, for example, right? Because again, okay, MATLAB is famous in engineering field. MATLAB is very expensive. <laughs> yeah, but then it's kind of the software you produce is also expensive, right? It's True. Yeah. <laughs> so I can actually <laughs> using less expensive tools. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, uh, honestly. Uh, MATLAB is great, but uh, I just can't justify the cost. <laughs> so I think that there's still time for discussions after the presentation. So let's thank our speaker for the fantastic talk. And uh, we have a little gift from a laureate. So you remember yes. our laureate, Royal Purple. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much.